Um, just to, I'm looking around the room, and I suspect um, people in the room uh, are aware of um, work that we've been doing recently in terms of our website, which is helpful from the opening slide there. Really, um, these remarks are a place to uh, keep in mind watching the live broadcast around the world. It's possibility, yes. Um, just to sort of, um, since November, we, we've been um, depositing uh, on the website uh, lots and lots of data. Um, so, for example, um, every local authority results from its uh, creation in 1973 or 64 in the case of the Northern Forest. Um, all of their results are available in a downloadable PDF on the website. Um, so, uh, also, the local elections handbooks, which are an annual uh, publication, uh, they're also available up until um, 2012. We're desperately still trying to find a um, way of making money at it. Um, publishing this stuff uh, to know about but um, they're again freely available. Um, and most recent uh, innovation um, is that uh, there is an application there whereby people uh, can go on the website and um, type in the name of their local authority and see its political control since uh, it was established, first established in 64 in London, um, 73 elsewhere. And, uh, you can see um, at a glance. Um, the strength of parties on each council and which party control the council in any given year. So I would have thought it's a boon um, for journalists in particular who can, who can with authority say the last time this council was hung was in 1978 or um, And um, <clears throat> we will continue to uh, put material there um, as and when uh, we feel it's time to sort of let go as, as we're in our kind of twilight years now. Uh, <laughs> well, well, um, we are making more and more data uh, about that. Okay, um, again, just um, probably insulting people uh, you know, in this room who are familiar with this, but uh, basically uh, these first few slides that I will talk about um, represent the by-election model uh, since uh, 2015. I've taken it back. Uh, as far as January 2015, so I can give you some flavour of, uh, of the trend over the past uh, 15 uh, months or so. Um, and um, basically, the um, basically the model uh, works with using uh, local council by-elections, and it takes the results of by-election and compares the those results with the uh, result in the previous May election and um, looks at the, at the change in vote share uh, in, in each by election and references that change in terms of the national public vote um, for a previous uh, election. And in this way, we build a kind of composite picture from a whole series of um, by election data in terms of what the national public vote is. In the sense, what it's trying to do is replicate the work of the opinion polls, but using uh, actual results and the way that people are, are voting for the uh, local by elections. This is the uh, profile of the Conservative Party uh, since January 2015, and you can see there a um, virtually nothing, of course. Um, it's flatlining. And it was the story of the previous parliament is that the Conservatives occupy a position somewhere in the region uh, of 30% uh, to uh, the mid 30s and more or less stayed there um, for, for the duration. Uh, it's a remarkable, uh, remarkably stable um, line. That for Labour, uh, you can see there um, a small rise as we uh, approach the uh, 2000. 15 general election, and for those uh, even with short memories will know that uh, in terms of our forecast, using this model to forecast the 2015 general election, we suggested it was going to be a dead heat stroke uh, hung upon, and 
um, in much the same way that the opinion polls, but for a quite different uh, set of data, uh, we'd arrived at more or less the same conclusion uh, as they had. And you can see, again, uh, the line for labor is, is more or less um, uh, uniform throughout the period. This is quite interesting now, the, the line for the little Democrats. Um, uh, if I'd gone back in time, uh, certainly the, the line uh, for the little Democrats would be a lot higher than it is uh, now. But nevertheless, what you've seen there is a, um, as, the, as the party um, performed as badly as it did in, in the 2015 general election um, and um, persuaded the party that all of their internal polling and uh, all their optimism about the seats that they would be taking as a fact for law, um, support uh, dwindled. But it, in recent months, so over the recent months, uh, it's begun to uh, climb again. So, uh, and Commonwealth will talk about this uh, later. That's quite interesting. Um, the the uh, profile for UKIP is uh, slightly different, of course, that they too um, uh, fell away after the general election. Um, they haven't had a similar climb. And again, um, Colin will be uh, referring to their performance uh, since um, the general election. And then finally, uh, for others, as you can see there, and this includes the Greens, um, of course, uh, they're around around. So, um, <coughs> fairly, uh, just to um, say uh, that these are rolling quarterly averages. Mm -hmm. uh, so, they, although uh, months are denoted at the bottom there, um, they are, we, we take uh, the results from, so March would be a composition, composite of, of, of um, March, some of February, and some of January. And these are weighted. <laughs> so, uh, this gets rid of a lot of um, noise that occurs with individual. So, summing up, this has neither been a Corbyn bounce nor a Corbyn crash. So the, the by-elections, uh, in much the same way as the opinion polls, they've, they've not really registered anything significant for Labour. Uh, the Conservatives' track is the same as it ever was. It just, just goes on uh, along this rather stable uh, path. Uh, there are indications that the Liberal Democrats are making some sort of a comeback. How much of a comeback? Uh, we've yet to uh, see, but they are re-establishing really local government presence, and UKIP support uh, is um, stabilising. Uh, but around what level uh, is yet to be uh, indicated. Uh, one of the um, features about uh, what's happened in recent years is the, is the, is the growth of the two-party nature of uh, English. Uh, local government, and, um, and therefore we're interested in, in terms of, of this, in terms of challenges to the conservative Labour dominance of, of local government. So I, I just put together a, a quick slide which looks at party contestation by elections. And this uh, is an interesting feature. What happened with the Liberal Democrats, of course, is that when they took up the offer uh, of, of joining the coalition government, uh, basically, their local government performance fell off the cliff. Uh, in, in repeated cycles of the uh, local elections in 2011, 2012, and so on, uh, the party basically got hammered uh, and massive erosion of their local government electoral base. And this also uh, manifested itself in uh, their participation in the council by elections. And you can't really blame them, we're getting uh, hammered everywhere, and therefore, uh, why? why uh, Indulging in that kind of um, treatment. So, but you'll see there in 2015, uh, since the general election, a, a rise. And so they now a little bit more confidence about them, and they are contesting places, even though it doesn't always pan out in terms of vote share, uh, they are actually uh, beginning to uh, participate. In that. Spectacular rise of UKIP in terms of uh, very good performances in 2012-13 prompted them to start contesting uh, by elections places that they have never done before, and again, they did uh, rather well in, in terms of not only participating in these projects, but also in terms of their vote share. And then finally, the Greens. And although the Greens, have, uh, again, are on a top of trajectory, in no sense are they uh, playing a part in local 
in the local council by-election uh, story as much as our UKIP and, uh, and the Liberal Democrats. So they're there, but they're, uh, it's, it's a rather, it's an even chance on whether you're going to get a green candidate in a by-election or not. Okay, so they're contesting about 50%. So the Lib Dems uh, disappear for a while, but they are beginning to uh, re-emerge. Uh, UKIP appear to have plateaued, and they appear to be um, falling away slightly in terms of their enthusiasm. And uh, Matt will uh, talk about uh, whether that uh, is manifested uh, elsewhere in, in terms of their performance and the Greens. Uh, it's, it's somewhat dramatic. Uh, a lot of people have talked about uh, the COVID factor, and again, this just looks at um, comparing Miliband in the first um, months after um, Miliband's election with that of COVID. And you can see there the gradual rise for Miliband and absolutely nothing at all uh, for Miliband. So it's neither adverse nor uh, positive uh, for COVID. It, it just it's had no effect in terms of their ability to um, win vote share of the council by-elections. So notwithstanding the massive increase in party members, it doesn't appear to have had any impact in terms of voter support uh, for Labour. These next, I'm just going to uh, race through these. So um, this is where, uh, th these are the uh, national polls. Uh, since, uh, again, over the same time period, I'm using dotted lines for the national polls. And so it's what it is interesting is to compare <coughs> what's happening in the by-elections with what's happening in the national polls. Can we, uh, is there some substance to what uh, the national polls are, are picking up in terms of the actual votes for these parties? Or like the general election, are we both wrong again? So this is the Conservative support in the by-elections, and that's the polls. Uh, so there is there's an opening up of a gap here in terms of uh, normally these lines are so close to one another you can barely distinguish them apart. But there is a small gap opening up there between uh, the polls uh, and the by-elections. So the Tories aren't doing as well in the by-elections as they are in the national polls. That's kind of um, different to what it has been in the past. For Labour, Labour is always ahead in the polls, they're, they're the polls and they're in the by-elections. So that, if, if you just showed me those two lines and didn't have them coloured, I would say that's the Conservative. Just looking at the lines, I'd say that's the Conservative. But, uh, so there's something slightly different um, post January 2015 and, and before. The Lib Dems, uh, it was ever thus. Oh, no, that's, that's, that's not right, is it? You've changed your third party. <laughs> Prematurely. Oh, <okay. laughs> Prematurely. I've changed the third party. Yeah, thank you. And it's also the wrong colour. That's um, UKIP. It's, it's not purple, it's kind of blue, though, is it? <laughs> um, so that's UKIP, and again, very close. Uh, but then the by election model got, the, got UKIP right, uh, the German election as well, so I'm not at all surprised by that. I did, I changed it. Uh, and that's the, um, the by elections, and there are the polls, the Lib Dems. Now, that, it's always been the case that the Lib Dem by-election model has always had the party do much better than the opinion polls. And in terms of the actual performance, that their performance in May, uh, it's, it's sort of been less than their by-election uh, share would suggest, but certainly more than their national poll share. So, um, so this will be interesting in terms of how they do it in May. And at that point, I will I mean, to change. Yeah, it's change. change. Okay, I'm going to talk about what might happen um, this May with a big emphasis on the word it might. Um, the council's. Oh, why can't I do this? Is this... Mm -hmm. that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, these are the councils uh, that are up in 2016 in terms of their political control. And I think I'd really just point to two things. This is the consequence of what has happened in a range of local elections dating back a cycle and more. 
And what we've found, this is something that really surprised us, and we've written a bit about this now, is that the local government complexion of this country is now more two-party centered than it has ever been, with emphasis on the word ever. And because, but there are so many more parties around now, and so many more candidates. And yes, there are, but because of first past the post, and because of the decline of the Liberal Democrats, and because of the failure of UKIP to get to the threshold, which I talk a bit about, and I'm sure Mark talked a lot about over the past few years, it's left the door open for Labour and the Conservatives. And so you look at that, of the 124 councils that have got elections this year, 99 are outright controlled by either Labour or the Conservatives, and the number of no control hung councils is at a record low figure, um, and that may well happen again. Nothing may happen to change that much this year. Um, and the Liberal Democrats are defending three councils, which is three of the only six in the country that they've got left. Um, Eastley they'll retain, that's a no brainer. Um, Cheltenham they might be damaged because they lost the seat because of the general election. And Watford has got all out elections because of boundary changes, which I think might also uh, cause them a bit of grief. So it's perfectly possible that the Liberal Democrats will end up with one council in control, despite not doing <coughs> perhaps particularly badly in this set. Yeah, elections. Arrow. Yes. Okay. So that's the councils, and these are the seats. And what we've done is we usually try to do. It didn't last year because of the um, exigencies dealing with the general election at the same time. In councils where there have boundary changes and have been boundary changes, we have allocated notional uh, winners to the wards and each of the seats which have got um, elections this year. It has a strange effect in some places. For example, in um, under the Met Barracks, you see that the UKIP are defending the grant over 28 seats uh, at these elections, 16 of those in the Met Barracks, and most of those in Rotherham, because Rotherham, of course, is having all out elections following government decree, no boundary changes to all out elections. And because UKIP had councils elected in um, Rotherham in, in 2014, especially, um, those uh, elected UKIP council seats from that time are defending. Otherwise, in the, uh, in the Mets and in the Unitaries, this is a fairly um, Labour, urban dominated uh, set of elections. And even in the Shires, the Shire districts, which have third elections by thirds or halves, um, which is a number, by the way, quite for real train spotters, the number of councils that are choosing to have all out elections is increasing very gradually. The number that have elections by thirds in particular is decreasing. So there are only 70 districts left which have elections either by thirds or by halves, and they tend to be, especially roughly in the old-fashioned language, called town district councils, um, and therefore Labour does perhaps rather more strongly there than it does in some of the other shires. So as you see, this is a kind of a Labour uh, set of um, elections on ballots um, that are up this time. Um, and that's not harmed by the fact, although I guess Jeremy Corbyn would wish otherwise, not harmed by the fact that the 2012 elections on which this set of reprises uh, was Labour's best set of local elections outside a coincidence general election since before Tony Blair became Prime Minister. It go, you know, they, they really did well, I and mean, if you cast your mind back to 2012, Miliband had this brief flash of glory, talk about him being Prime Minister, I think that was the, the year of the conference speech for the, um, the One Nation and all that kind of thing. When they, they, he seemed to have a bit of uh, traction, Labour quite easily won the Corby by-election, all sorts of things like that were, were going on. And so Labour, parties are always claiming this, but for Labour this really is a high watermark. Uh, for them to defend, which we will see um, in a minute. So, as usual, we've done that. Mike Smithson will be getting out his uh, camera and to take a picture of the slide. <laughs> purely <laughs> 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 Move to one side. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, He's the, obliged to do this now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, is, this is the National Criminal Code, which you've, we, currently, which you've already seen um, in Michael's slides through a slightly different way. Um, the figure in plain type is the current national equivalent show vote based on by-elections. The figure in italics in brackets is the poll of polls equivalent figure. And what you see there 
is what Mike was talking about. The Conservatives doing slightly less well, um, and Labour too, slightly less well at uh, the by-elections when they carry on in the polls. UKIP doing much the same in both sets of uh, figure. Um, the Liberal Democrats really doing much rather better than uh, the polls are suggesting in terms of their recovery. And in that sense, you can see, therefore, the likely consequence of this in terms of what happened in 2012, when our national equivalent vote after those elections, in other words, taking account of the actual results of those elections, was Conservative 33, Labour 39, Lib Dem 15, UK 5. This was the last set of elections before UK really came to the scene as a, as a political force as the third party, as my colleague now elevates them to. <coughs> and you see the Conservatives will be, are likely to be down a bit compared with our current forecast. Labour will be down really rather a lot because you know, it almost has been impossible for them to think about uh, matching that 2012 figure and as Michael was showing their performance since the last general election has essentially flat line as the Conservatives. Liberal Democrats are still, you know, they look so they're doing okay. Um, UK twice as well as it was doing in 2012, but not sufficient um, perhaps to get the kind of breakthrough it's had in other elections recently. So the upshot of that is we'd expect the Conservative vote to be down a bit, the Labour vote to be down quite a lot. The uh, Liberal Democrats to be sort of flatlining to up, uh, UKIP to be up quite a bit, and then the Independents and others, who again, you know, they're, they're, they're there, the more of them are bad, they win the odd seats. They're also going to attract quite a lot of support. And to sort of tease Michael on for one more slide at least, um, <coughs> you can see that how much 2012 was such a successful election for Labour. These are the 2004, 2008, and 2012 are elections that took place at this same point in the cycle. Right? 2008 is especially good election for the Conservatives. That was what was called Brown, the Prime Minister, the Cameron's leader the opposition. Conservatives were polling over 40% in these kind of elections that time. They, they swept all before them, despite the nature of these um, seats and councils for the elections. In 2012, it was rather the reverse of that. And I put 2014 in there for a particular reason, because you see, to the, uh, apart from the UKIP figure in 2014, you could argue that those results in terms of seats were quite similar. Right? And, that, and one of the reasons for showing that is because it shows how the first past the post system comes back to bite us whenever we try to make predictions about what's going to happen in terms of a share of the vote giving a particular number of seats. Because in 2014, the Labour national equivalent share of the vote was 31%. And remember, and there's some figures on this in the back of the uh, reading pack. Um, and remember in 2012, I said it was 39%. And yet, because of how the votes distributed, that was good enough for Labour to get still over a thousand seats in that election. The Conservative share fell back by one point, they got slightly fewer seats, the Liberal Democrats fell back by five points between comparing 2012 and 2014, and yet finally they emerged with even more seats than they had in 2012. So, taking those two benchmark points into account, 2012, and I think 2014 is important because of how it uh, marked this sort of stage towards <coughs> Two and two and two halves, or four quarter politics, or call it what you will, um, in England. It looks to us as if the possibility could be this year that there was a fairly modest um, turnover in seats, but something of this nature. So Labour will suffer. It's hard to think how Labour are going to do anything other than suffer. But the gainers from Labour's suffering look as if they will likely be Conservative, Liberal Democrat and UKIP in fairly even order. And within the context of the kind of talk that we usually have about um, you know, 
gains and losses in, in the sort of in the many hundreds. Well, A is the scope for that this year because they're only 2,400 seats up anyway. Um, but because of the sort of the, the flat line that Michael has been talking about, and despite what seems to be a plummeting of Labour support compared to four years ago, um, their losses, if they're kept at this kind of level, are something I suspect they can, um, they can probably defend, especially given that everything else is going on and anyway, the attention is going to be in Scotland, whereas I guess and I'm not like, they are not any kind of elections, although as ever, we'd be voting for those elections with the best and independent underlying um, support nationally than the other sorts of elections. We don't know. Um, let me very also, like Mike, very briefly, then just slightly treading on Matt's toes. Um, because people you can think that's not very much, is it? Well, they only won seven seats, they're defending more, but they only won seven seats in um, 2012 across the country. Uh, these are their hot spots as far as councils are concerned. And what I, again, you can look at this in your own time, but what I would draw your attention to is the fact that UKIP effectively only win council seats when they get more than 30% share of the vote across the district. Um, that was true in 2013, it was true in 2014. Look in 2015, when competing with the general election, there were only very few places where they managed to get over 30% of the vote. These are councils that are the real UK uh, heartland uh, territory. Um, so in the general election of Rotherham, as all other elections again this year, and thorough um, in particular, else, and Basil Lynch was by less extent, elsewhere they simply didn't win seats, despite getting 20% of the vote more, and nothing that's happened, I said, Matt was right on this, nothing that's happened to UKIP since 2015 suggests that they're going to do um, anything like what they did in 2013 and 2014. Of course they will win seats, but uh, they will not become the story, and so our thinking, or is that not, the Liberal Democrats are bound to win the largest number of seats compared to the UK at these local elections, but we also think for the first time since 2012 that the Liberal Democrats will probably come as third party in terms of votes again at the local elections. Now that's maybe, you know, that's a, that's a judgment call, but everything we've seen going on so far, there were, <coughs> in the six month run up to the General election, there are about 60 by-elections. UKIP's average share of voting in those by-elections is 25%. In the last six months, there have been about 60 by-elections. UKIP's average share of voting in those 60 by-elections has been about 12%. And the Liberal Democrats have scored the other. That's the problem that we will wait to um, hear about that in a minute. So, council control change, yeah, there may be a few. The cons there are places that the Conservatives won at the general election, retained at the general election, where if they do okay and Labour does badly, particularly in the south of England, you may see a swing against the trend, perhaps Conservatives winning um, Crawley, for example, winning Three Rivers, if the Liberal Democrats aren't back and back. Um, in the nor northern parts of Britain, uh, Kirklees, Chafford, you may continue to see a swing away uh, from the Conservatives, um, which would help Labour. Uh, Bristol's quite interesting because there's the Mayor, there's the Liberal Democrats used to do well in Bristol, now the Greens have done the opposition on the council. Farrak is probably his best shot in a way of doing something still um, at these elections. But they're not going to be very dramatic, but I think they will tell us something about how uh, the pattern of people's uh, loyalties has changed since 2015, and perhaps particularly what people is the issue of uh, Labour. Um, I, I asked Helena about talking about the Police and Crime Commission elections and she very quietly said no one was very interested in <laughs> <laughs> Which is what's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. Though, isn't it? Um, however, we're having them. It's the second cycle. The turnout, as you remember last time, was only 15%. Um, it will be more than that this time, though I suspect it will still be difficult and quite interesting to see what the turnout is in those places in England don't have local elections because that means that there will not be any door-to-door -door, uh, canvassing, there will not be leaflets about the elections, whereas if you've got local elections, you've got councils coming around, you've got leafleting like, and in Wales, of course, you've got the National Assembly um, elections, all of which will encourage turnout. So that will be worth looking at, see whether people are prepared to come out to vote for these things 
Uh, regardless, as you see, in 2012 in both England and Wales, the independent and other candidates did very well. And in England, they even got some return for their share of the vote, a rather strange um, set of outcomes, which then gives us some places uh, to watch. In terms of this, um, just at, at random looking at Humberside, you will remember uh, all this way John Prescott stood as the Labour candidate. Uh, the Conservatives just narrowly won that over him in 2012. Will the fact that he's not the candidate this time going to help Labour probably will? Um, should do, Labour should win that. Elsewhere, it's what's, one of the things interesting to look at is what's happening uh, to those independents who elected. Anne Barnes, the woman in Kent, has been rather controversial um, and isn't standing in. Uh, the independent elected in Lincolnshire, who first suspended and then had to reinstate his chief constable following a high court judgment. There's been all kinds of these issues going on in the police and crime commission world, if you've been uh, following it. In Lincolnshire, it was independent and independent, and what the reaction of the electorate will be to that. But as ever, as in 2012, the police and crime commission elections, especially when there are no local elections, will tell you little about what's going on in terms of uh, political uh, trends across the country, but I think the local elections will. And the two things to look for, the degree to which Labour suffers in terms of share of the vote compared to 2012, and how that is then translated into a loss of seats, and of course how the narrative of the Labour Party goes is whether that's then coupled with doing poorly in Wales and poorly in Scotland and poorly in London at the same time. Um, and the other thing to look out for is the weather after a gap of three years, 13, 14, 15, the Lib Dems can get back to being the third party in both seats and votes uh, in England, which I think will be something that some of them are successful in, which they will obviously attract a more damaging view of the show. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to shut them off. Go on to the next one. Thank you.
this point about flatlining really reflects that organisational weakness that the party has, as much as it reflects, uh, you know, the sort of voter disconnect after UKIP's uh, uh, failure to to engineer a breakthrough at Westminster last year, you know, and in essence, this is a political party that, in many respects, it's avoiding doing all the things it needs to do because of a few things that have happened. One is, one is that the leadership was clearly burned by the old by-election last year. We had all of this talk by sort of analysts saying that UKIP were poised to defeat Labour at Oldham West uh, and Royton. That was never going to happen. UKIP were never going to come close to knocking Labour off in a core Labour heartland. It didn't have the local organisation, the demographics of that seat were very different. Uh, and so it finishes a distant second. I think that hurt the party. Since then, and since the general election, uh, UKIP has struggled to sustain two incredibly important things for a small party, money and manpower. Its membership has slumped by at least 10,000 members, possibly more. Many of those members uh, are, not, are not active. Um, we did a survey of the UK membership last year, um, and then this is not a young, dynamic, active party. Money uh, is very scarce. Uh, that's reflected in the party's relocation of its headquarters. A lot of influential donors have stepped back. Uh, and it has not really been kind of revitalizing its grassroots base in the way that perhaps it should have been doing after the general election. All of, all of, all of that has really fueled an internal conversation, which I think is quite interesting, and something I wrote about last week, um, a conversation that within the party uh, that activists will sort of, you know, share with others quite openly around the possibility uh, of establishing something new in, in, in the scenario where Remain wins a referendum by, let's say, 52% of the vote, 55% of the vote. I think there's a discussion led by uh, influential uh, donors who are on sort of leave.eu side read between the lines, I'm not sure it would take you too long to figure out who I'm talking about, alongside um, uh, UK uh, sort of top level activists um, who have been looking in particular at Bethany Greer's movement in Italy, which uh, according to a poll last week is, is on over 25% of the vote, obviously a very different electoral system. But they're now beginning to have a discussion around uh, what a post-referendum type movement would look like, because I think it's fair to say there is a consensus among most of the people who matter that UKIP could well be nearing the end of its lifespan, that it's set out to achieve a referendum. <coughs> they feel that that's happened, and in the case of the <coughs> and Brexit not happening, how then do they continue to pressure uh, Cameron and the Conservative Party and others who, uh, who you know, are sort of keeping Britain within the EU, and that could take different forms. I mean, you know, we can talk, pick some questions maybe, but you get Paul Nuttles, you know, Paul Nuttall and, and, and people like that who say, actually the future for a UKIP successor movement is to talk more about integration in Islam, a kind of Gert Wilders type party, and then you get your sort of Farages who say, actually the future is more around Beppe Grillo and a populist decentralised party that is sort of delegated power to members. Of course, all of this is redundant if Brexit um, happens. But I thought it was an interesting observation to start you off with. Um, now, in terms of uh, what, what might happen next month, of course, which, which is a more immediate sort of interest, um, just something that I was doing uh, a couple of evenings ago, this is not um, applying any weights or anything, but just looking in general terms of the performance of UKIP at local parliament, local by-elections, sorry, uh, since the general election, just a change in the vote share. And it, this isn't really anything that is, uh, this is quite crude, but it, what, the point I'm trying to get across is that if this is a movement that is continuing to grow, well, it's clearly not the case. UKIP has been struggling consistently at local uh, by-elections. And one of the reasons why you often see very sharp falls in support for UKIP is that um, in a number of these uh, local elections, they simply can't find people to stand. Um, so, so, so many of these <coughs> elections uh, where it was present in 2012, 
often it is not present <coughs> or has not been present this year. In other cases, it's simply just that voters are not as enthusiastic or not as interested in the UKIP uh, phenomenon as perhaps uh, they were in earlier years. And you know, again, the average change in the UKIP vote share uh, each month, I think, underlies the fact that as this party goes into the elections uh, in a few weeks' time, it's it's perhaps not just flatlining, but you know, it's it's, it's, it's perhaps doing a little worse than that, and it's, it's not uh, rallying support anywhere near to the extent that a genuine kind of insurgent party uh, should be. Um, there are opportunities for UKIP to regain momentum, but I think one of the important points, perhaps that hasn't been mentioned and should be, is that these areas in the local elections are not the party's priority. So if you talk to anybody who, who's sort of within UKIP and running these campaigns, the priority is very much Wales, which I'll talk about in a second. The local elections are sort of distant uh, uh, issue for UKIP. They're really not talking about how to take control of Rotherham Council or how to assume control of the borough. And I think, again, that's a strategic mistake uh, on the part of UKIP, but um, you know, nonetheless, these are the areas where I, I would point to uh, Rotherham, obviously, but there, you know, UKIP has, I think, damaged its brand because it's run very negative, toxic campaigns against child sexual exploitation, which clearly not mobilise support to the extent that uh, they, they were intended to. Dudley, where you get a very local active branch um, and, and sort of more traditional uh, traditional labour areas, Gateshead, South Tyneside and Sunderland, where the party locally has uh, some, some reasonably experienced people. Plymouth, Portsmouth and Thurrock and Eastleigh, these are sort of the earlier areas for the party where it does have some fairly um, some fairly well embedded activists, Thurrock in particular, where essentially Tim Aker is sort of hanging his uh, future leadership ambitions on being able to make a mark after failing to take the seat in a very close contest last May, where um, I think the closest marginal race in the entire election, um, Aker ended up third, um, but was hoping uh, and was many were widely assuming within UK that he would sort of take that seat and then you know, begin to sort of move move forward within the party. Great Yarmouth is an interesting one, but there the UKIP, one of the more influential activists has experienced some problems and some legal problems which has prevented him from playing a more active role. It's all sort of UKIP land stuff. Um, but, but internally, you know, the big story essentially is what's happening in Wales. And I think, you know, where UKIP is going to be lucky next month is that the headlines will focus on UKIP for the first time in its history winning seats in the Welsh Assembly. The headlines will not focus on the broader picture which Colin and Michael and I pointed to, which is a party that is actually stuttering, that is not really breaking through. This is from the latest Welsh election study um, uh, and the work of Roger Scully, and the, um, who I recommend sort of following and looking, looking at online. Um, and it just shows the changes from the last wave in February, constituency voting tension, UKIP on 15%, that's a drop of three points since February, and I, I, I just sort of chat at House Rules and so on, I'm told that the picture and some of the data that has not gone public yet is bleaker for UKIP, that's what looked like a gathering uh, campaign in December and January, in a, a, apparently now looks to be running a little bit out of steam and there are different theories as to why that might be but I think the most credible is that UKIP in Wales has run a fairly mediocre at best campaign which has been plagued by that usual problem in the UKIP namely infighting uh, and disputes over who should stand where and involving yet again none other than Neil Hamilton who somehow manages to insert himself in the centre of every UKIP scandal or dare I say many more scandals uh, that <laughs> just happened in UKIP. Uh, in the regional vote share which you know uh, is where UKIP is likely to uh, be picking up um, uh, its seats, it's on 14% but a drop of four points. Um, now, currently it's projected to win seven seats, two in North Wales, two in Mid and West Wales, one in South West, one in South Central, one in uh, South East. Interestingly, a lot of overlaps in Wales, uh, 
with areas where in the early and mid 2000s the BMP was very strong. You can, uh, the map or support for you can be there's a lot of overlap uh, in those areas, which, which is quite interesting for the real uh, train spotters among us. Um, but uh, I actually, my personal view is even that is optimistic. There have been some kind of UK analysts uh, close to Labour who have been sort of predicting that you know, UK would get up to nine or ten seats. I, I really think actually now looking at the data that I think UK will be quite lucky to walk away with five or six seats. Um, I, I, my hunch uh, from internal conversations but also from looking simply at the latest data is that this is a party that is limping toward the finish line rather than uh, gathering more momentum. So it may well uh, find itself on the one hand saying yes finally uh, you know, it is in the Welsh Assembly but on the other hand asking itself could it, could it have done much better given the broader issue uh, agenda of British politics. Great. Now, questions. Yeah. Question, Matthew, which is uh, UKIP's choice of venue for the party conferences is actually totally quite.